All right, welcome to everyone who has joined us so far and welcome to this month's INCORE Connect and Explore webinar. We're really glad that you could be here with us today and we have a couple of great speakers for you today. Our spotlight for today is optimizing recess for healthy child development. And the presentation today will be followed by Q&A with our presenters and then a few quick announcements before we wrap up. I am your moderator, Karen Hilliard, from the INCORE Coordinating Center, and we have two fantastic speakers for you today. So let me go ahead and introduce them. The first one is Will Massey, and Will is an associate professor in the School of Biological and Population Health Sciences and the program director of the Kinesiology Graduate Program at Oregon State University. Dr. Massey's research focuses on the intersection of play, physical activity, and child development. His current line of research is dedicated to understanding how recess quality impacts healthy development in elementary school aged children. And our second speaker today is Kim Clevenger. And Kim is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Science at Utah State University. Dr. Clevenger's research focuses on the promotion and measurement of physical activity in children with an emphasis on how the physical environment can facilitate play. Let me go over a few technical details before we get started with today's presentation. First of all, if you have a question for our speakers during the webinar, you don't need to wait for the Q&A. You can go ahead and write that question into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. That is where we'll be taking all of the questions from. So again, at any point in the presentations, feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. If at any point you need technical assistance with the webinar, please let us know using the chat box. If you have any problem with audio or anything else, uh, you can give that information to us in the chat. And if you're having trouble logging into the webinar, please email us. You can do that at encore at fhi dot, excuse me, at fhi360.org, and we will work with you to resolve the problem. I also want to let you know that we're going to be tweeting today's webinar from, uh, from the Encore Twitter account. And if you'd like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag ConnectExplore. Before we get started today, we have a couple of poll questions for all of you in the audience. And the first question that I'd like to ask you to reply to is, what did you enjoy the most about recess when you were a kid? And there's just, you have to make just one choice here, but the options are socializing with friends, being outside, playing on the playground equipment, engaging in active play, playing pickup sports, getting a break from sitting in class, maybe you didn't like recess, or if there's something else, you can put it in the chat. So please go ahead and reply to that. I'm seeing in the chat that tag and dodgeball were favorites of at least one person. We just got a couple more people to respond here. Three, two, one. And let's go ahead and end the poll and share the results. All right, so uh, so I see that in this group, at least, socializing with friends was one of the most uh, favorite activities during recess. Uh, a lot of people also enjoying playing pick, pick up sports, engaging in active play like jump rope or hopscotch, playing on the playground equipment, and of course, getting a break from sitting in class and being outside. And it's wonderful to see that there's not anybody in our group today that didn't enjoy recess. So that's, that's good news. But uh, a lot of different favorite memories here. So thank you for sharing that. We have a second poll question that we'd like to ask all of you, which is, um, it is how much scheduled time do you think that elementary students in your own hometown school district, wherever you live now, uh, get for recess each day. And we're focusing in on elementary students here just to make it a little easier to answer the question. But what do you think? Do they get less than 20 minutes? 20 to 40, 40 to 60, more than 60, 
If you're not sure, that's okay. If you're pretty sure, go ahead and make a guess. Got a few folks still to respond to this. And we're gonna, of course, reveal what the reality is out there in just a minute, but, um, but if you could all answer what you think the scheduled amount of time is for recess for most elementary students in your school district each day. All right, I think we've got all the answers we're probably gonna get here. So let's go ahead and reveal the results. And um, among the group, you estimated 20 to 40 minutes as being the, about half of all school districts, maybe um, allowing 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and then maybe just under a third of you said less than 20 minutes. Um, and then a few folks said maybe 40 to 60. And then, of course, there were some some folks who were not sure. And I'm going to let the panelists in just a moment reveal to you what the actual answers are there. Um, they've got that to talk about and a whole bunch more. So let me go ahead now and turn it over to uh, our first speaker, Will Massey, and then he will hand off to Kim Clevenger. Will? Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm going to introduce us to recess. I assume that, you know, most of us on the call know what recess is. But the American Academy of Pediatrics defines recess as a necessary break um, in the day for optimizing children's social, emotional, physical, and cognitive development. In essence, it should be considered a child's personal time. And so one of the reasons why I want to just start with this is because if we think about the Kind of the broad range of optimizing child development here, um, social, emotional, physical, and cognitive are pretty big buckets. Um, if we look at the trajectory of recess research in the 80s and 90s, really a lot of the research was more around social and emotional development, how recess was an avenue for children to play, interact, engage, build social and leadership skills. And then around 2000, when we started paying a lot more attention to childhood obesity and public health really kind of stepped into the recess space. What we've seen is a primary primary focus of recess research being about how can we optimize this environment to make kids more active. We can go to the next slide. Um, so we know that recess can promote health enhancing physical activity. Uh, some studies have shown that up to 70% of weekly physical activity for children come at recess. Um, a range of studies have shown, you know, anywhere from 10 to 65% of physical activity during the school day happens at recess. And so we've looked at this through a public health lens. Uh, this is a very active place in the school day. We have a problem with childhood obesity. If we can further optimize how active kids are, um, then that can help with that. As a aside to that, we also know that physical activity um, has benefits for cognitive, emotional, academic development. And so studies have shown that both acute and chronic levels of physical activity has positive implications for children's brain function and development. Um, we know that physical activity has important implications for mental health. Um, and a lot of studies have shown that kids who are more active or get, who get more activity during the day actually score higher on tests. So we've had this focus on how can we get kids to be more active? Um, the, the problem with that, at least from my perspective and in, in some of the work, let's stay on the previous slide. <laughs> um, the problem with that, thanks, is that um, physical activity at recess happens within a social context. And so you know, when we think of physical activity, a lot of those studies are done in a way in which we're just, we're isolating the physical activity and we're looking at the benefits of it. Um, but recess happens in the context of a lot of other things happening socially. Um, and so the, the, the data on the right is just some observations we've done, time point sampling to kind of give you a sense of what kids have been doing at recess since COVID. Um, and that physical activity can take place in a lot of different ways. And so one of the things that I like to, or the, the one of the stories that I like to tell, um, because I think it's it's really important to understanding how we look at recess is we did a study five or six years ago where we put accelerometers on kids at recess and we tracked how active they were, but we also did observations of what was actually happening at recess. And for some schools, 
what we found was that recess was a very unsafe place. And so we would go out and do observations um, and we would see just almost consistent, like big group fights at recess, people running from each other, people punching, kicking, hitting each other. And, and it turns out that fighting is actually a very vigorous physical activity. But if we think about that physical activity in the context of, is this good for children's social, emotional, physical, and cognitive development? I can tell you that kids going back into the school, beat up, angry, emotional, biologically dysregulated is not really facilitating some of those things. And so we can go to the next slide. And so there's kind of a, a big but here in that recess we know is where bullying and antisocial behavior happen during school. We know that recess can be a place of exclusion. Um, we know for some children, they feel unsafe at recess. And there's data to suggest that recess is one of the most problematic areas of the elementary school day for staff. This is where principals spend a lot of their afternoon kind of dealing with some of the things that happened at recess. We know that the um, paraeducators and educational assistants who are out there are often burned out and don't know what to do. We've collected data um, again over the past couple of months coming out of COVID. Um, and this is data from over a thousand fourth and fifth grade students where we ask them if they feel unwelcome or uncomfortable at recess due to race, ethnicity, their grades, their religion, their family's income, disability status, um, the language they speak in their home, their appearance and their interest. And, and we can see that much higher rates than we would want in terms of folks who feel unwelcome or uncomfortable at recess. And so, um, you know, up to a quarter of kids are responding that recess essentially isn't a safe space for them. And we know that if we want kids to develop socially, emotionally, and cognitively at a baseline, their kind of core need for safety has to be taken care of. Um, and so while recess can be an amazing place for child development and where we can make kids more active, we have to consider how that activity takes place and the social context in which it takes place. The other thing that we know about recess is it's completely inequitable. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so there are disparities in um, how much time children get for recess. If you want to pull up the graph there, this is older data, but um, really anytime this data is collected, we kind of see a, a consistent pattern that children in inner city schools, children in economically disadvantaged schools, and children in racial and ethnic minority schools um, get the least amount of time for recess. Um, we also know that there's a shortage of nationally consolidated data on recess access and quality. Um, and so, you know, when we think about from a from a macro policy standpoint of what's happening at recess and how we can make it better, there's not a lot of great data out there to help us inform those decisions. And so Kim is actually going to dive a little bit deeper into the data that does exist. Um, and so I will hand it over to her now. Thank you, Will. So it was really interesting to see all the variability and in, in how much recess everyone gets in their different uh, school districts, because normally when I tell people that I study recess, the first response is, oh, this is how much recess I had as a kid, or this is how much recess my kids get right now. And so I became really curious about, well, do we even know how much recess kids get in the United States? And that's really what my portion of the talk right now is going to be about is what's the current state of recess like in the US. The other thing that really kind of drove this my interest in this area of research was I started to read some really old uh, research from the late 1800s and the early 1900s um, about recess provision. And it was so interesting that everyone just said everything that we say now. They were like, kids don't have enough recess. Kids are getting less recess than they did before. We focus too much on academic uh, in, in school. And I was like, wow, we haven't learned anything in 100 years. And a really interesting kind of factoid that came up in one of these papers was that kids had to do five minutes of classwork to get a one minute of recess break. And this was kind of the ratio. About 20% of the school day was spent in recess. And so I started wondering what, what that number would look like now. And I did some very back of the napkin math, which you can see on the next slide. Well, I won't show you the literal napkin because it would be illegible. But my, my kind of outcome here was that 
I think now kids would have to do 13 or 14 minutes of classwork to get one minute of recess. And this again is like, well, is that enough? I'm not sure. The other thing that I'd, I'd like everyone to consider is, you know, if you are an adult and you go to work for eight hours a day, um, you would be federally mandated to have a lunch break and to have a couple of 15 minute breaks during your day. And it's kind of bizarre to me that we treat children almost the same way. They go to school for seven hours and they only get, you know, something like a 20 minute break during the day. So again, I wanted to more formally look at how much recess kids were actually getting. So you can go to the next slide. So the project that I'm going to be talking to you about today uh, is one in which we wanted to look at all of the nationally representative surveillance data that we had about recess in the United States over the last decade. And so we identified surveillance systems using NCORE's catalog, which uh, if you haven't seen before, is a really useful tool for finding data, not just nationally representative data, but all types of data. And they're gonna put the link to that in the chat, I believe. Um, and, and what we wanted to do was look beyond just recess provision and how much recess kids were getting we wanted to see, next slide, how we were doing with a, a variety of recommendations that have been set forth by the Centers for Disease Control and Shape America. And specifically, um, these two, I don't know what to call them, programs, units, offices, whatever, uh, have come up with eight recess recommendations, which you can see on my next slide. Next slide. Yay. Okay, so on the left, you can see these eight recommendations set forth by the CDC and Shape America. There are things like making sure that all children kindergarten through 12th grade are provided at least 20 minutes of daily recess. And then what you're looking at is each of these little rectangles is a different surveillance system that we found that's nationally representative in the US. And you can see the, the different surveillance systems down at the bottom. And in parentheses, it tells you the, the level of the data. So is it at the state level? Is it at the parent level? Is it at the school level, et cetera? And so you notice a few things from this, this figure. The first is that most of the surveillance systems are focusing on providing, on whether kids are provided 20 minutes of daily recess. We also unfortunately see that most of the surveillance systems stopped collecting data after 2016. And then you'll see that the outline of the boxes tells us what age of kids that they were focusing on. And the solid color is elementary school. So you can see that most of these surveillance systems are focusing on elementary school. Next slide. So we wanted to, to look at alignment with these eight recommendations. And since it's so much data at all these different levels and all the questions are different, we kind of summarize this as a report card. So A, B, C, D, or F, how are we doing for each of these eight recommendations? Now I'm gonna take you through a real whirlwind tour of, of the results. So the first, like I said, is 20 minutes of daily recess. This is the one we have the most data on. On the left, we have percent of children uh, in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey who had no recess way on the left, so that's about 7% of kids, and who had each combination of number of days of recess and amount of recess. So kind of the takeaway here is that we have about 66% of kids who seem to be getting uh, the recommendation of 20 minutes of daily recess. Although you can see these categories that were used kind of preclude us from seeing exactly the number that meet that recommendation. And then on the right, you'll see um, in, in some other surveillance systems that we estimate that 73 to 79% of kids get 20 minutes of daily recess or on average 25 or 27 minutes per day. So this, this would be the answer, I guess, to your question for now. This is how much recess kids get on average in the US. However, I will say that all of this data, it focuses on elementary school age children. And if you look at the next slide, well, the problem is, is that we start to see, if we look at, we look at the percent of kids with any recess by grade, we start to see this decline around fifth or sixth grade. And unfortunately, because all of these surveillance systems are so focused on elementary school children, we don't know what happens after that. Except one study, the school nutrition meal cost study on the right, they asked one question that was, what physical activity opportunities are available at your school? And principals from all types of schools responded. And that is really lucky for us because it's our only nationally representative indication of the percent of middle and high schoolers that get any recess. And you can see that there's kind of this sharp decline. 
So if we go back to the report card on the next slide, there we go. We rated this as a B for younger children, or uh, I think a very gracious C for older youth. It might be worse than that. We just don't have good data to say. The next one I won't focus on too much on the next slide because um, this recommendation is to have recess before lunch, uh, which is mostly beneficial to, to make sure that kids aren't wasting their food. And the way these questions were asked is kind of confusing, but basically what we're finding is that 53 to 62% of schools say that any child has recess before lunch versus 79 to 84% of schools have any children that have recess after lunch. So again, that's a super confusing way of asking that question. But on the next slide, you can see that based on this very limited data, we've rated this as a D because it seems that children are more likely to get recess after lunch than before lunch. The next one is to not exclude students for disciplinary or academic reasons. Uh, this one, we have a few data points. Uh, both school districts and schools, about half of them say that they discourage this practice. However, when, they, when they're asked about, you know, what's the response when a kid does break the rules, they report that they do sometimes or almost always take away playtime or recess time from those kids. So that's not great. And for that reason, we rated it as a C. So again, not doing so great. The next one is to not use recess as a replacement for gym class or PE. In this case, we only have state level policy data. And what we see is that about 10 states, not about 10 states in 2021, had a policy or a law that said that recess couldn't be used as a replacement for PE. But because we only have state law data, we rated this as insufficient because we really wanted to have multiple levels of data. So school, school district, parent, state, et cetera. The next one is to have adequate spaces or facilities for recess. Unfortunately, we have no nationally representative data on this. We also have no nationally representative data on the next one, which is using physical activity during recess as punishment. Um, and then the next one we do have data on, and I'm very happy to say that this is where we perform the best. Most teachers report that playground safety is something that they teach about. It's something that their school has uh, policies about. And the district also has policies about. So this is really good. And this is our first and only A. Yay. Lastly, ongoing professional development. If we go to the next slide, um, this one we, we do have some data on, but it doesn't look that good. Uh, we only have, you know, 42 to 44 percent of districts saying that playground monitors uh, get training or that they have given um, or they have a policy about whether playground monitors have training. So in this case, again, we gave it a, a rating of insufficient just because um, we don't have we don't have data at multiple levels um, about professional development for recess, recess staff. And I will say that that one's really important. Actually, let me point out too, I, I forgot an earlier one. So for adequate spaces and facilities for recess, this is really important because we know, like Will said, that there's socioeconomic disparities in the, the quality of the recess environment. So we definitely need data on that. Similarly, this last one is really important because like Will mentioned, preventing bullying and these kind of aggressive acts by kids a lot of that comes down to having trained recess staff that know how to keep kids engaged in a safe and happy, healthy way. So that's another one that we really need more data on. So if we go to the question uh, of whether kids are getting enough recess, I don't think that we can answer it yet because there's a lot of unanswered questions. Next slide. And I've listed some of them here. Things like, uh, we don't actually know how much recess kids are getting, right? I presented some data, but a lot of it is from pre-2016. And of course, there's probably pandemic-related changes that we're not capturing because we don't have ongoing national surveillance data. There's also this interesting question about actual versus scheduled recess. There was a study where they just randomly showed up to a representative sample of schools, and they found that only 20% of those schools had recess on that day. So that's very different than what people are reporting in our surveys that we use for national surveillance. We also don't know if the question is, are kids getting enough recess? What's enough? What's the optimal amount of recess? Is it 20 minutes per day? We don't know. 
And then like Will alluded to, it's not just about the quantity of recess, it's also about the quality of recess. So we probably need to be surveying some other things like the quality of recess, the accessibility of recess, whether recess is being equitably given to everyone. And so there's definitely some unanswered questions here uh, that we can't, can't, can't quite answer yet. But with that, I will switch back over to Will. Awesome, thanks, Kim. And as we think about recess and policy, I think there's more and more policy pushes um, for recess at the state legislative level, um, but a lot of those are still related to time and ensuring really a minimal time. Um, a lot of them around that 20 minute threshold. And so when we think about quality, um, and I think this kind of um, goes back and forth a little bit about access, time, and quality of the environment. The place that I like to start is what do the children think? Because I think we can learn a lot from children about what recess should be like, and it's it's quite informative. Um, if we want to just go ahead and, and put the bullets up, I can kind of talk through them. Um, one thing we know is that equipment and facilities are important to children and their recess activities. Um, there's been some good work, qualitative work from Charlotte Pulowski out of Denmark, I believe, um, that has really looked at, you know, what do children talk about when it comes to recess? And one of the things we know is that, like, if proper equipment, facility, space, green space, areas to play for children are not provided or accessible, um, one, that can create problems, but two, it it can also create, which is another bullet here, just more power hierarchies in terms of, like, who, who gets access to the limited resources at recess. Um, Another thing that children tell us um, directly, this is in the in the literature and almost any time that we go and do focus groups with kids at schools, is that recess is both too short um, and that there is not enough sessions of recess during the day. And so, you know, I think getting to that, are kids getting enough recess? If we ask the children, they would say no. Um, I know there's a study done, I want to say 2011 or 2012, that actually looked at recess time across um, the world. And, and really, if we look at it, the US is is pretty close to dead last in terms of how much time um, for outdoor play children get relative to how much time they're spending in the classroom. The next two bullets, I think, are incredibly important. Um, and it kind of speaks to the, you know, the one place on the report card that Kim mentioned where we got an A is that safety is reinforced. And so um, there's a dichotomy that exists between what children want out of adults at recess and what adults view their roles as. And so um, students think that teachers or staff at recess enforce rules that are anti-fun. Um, they see the adults out there as kind of the, the, the people who are saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, and they want to be able to take more risks. Um, they want to be able to, to engage in play where, you know, they can climb things and jump off of things and run fast and, and really just do the things that, that children should be able to do. Um, on the flip side, teachers and staff see their role as ensuring physical safety of children. Um, and so they they view their role out there is to make sure that the rules are followed so that nobody gets hurt. And so there's a, there's a discrepancy there. Whereas what children want from teachers is support and engagement around um, how do we navigate social situations? How do we navigate conflict? How do we make sure that play is inclusive? And so there's just this, there's a pattern that we see in a lot of the work we do kids want to be more free to take physical risks in play, and they want more social and emotional support from staff. Staff see their role to make sure that nobody gets hurt and that the children should figure out the social and emotional stuff themselves. Um, and so when we think about recess quality, you know, I always say I lean towards the side of the children on this one, where we want to open it up for them to be able to take physical risk and explore, and we want to help teach and guide them in navigating those social relationships. Um, we also know, like I mentioned, um, gender conformity, power hierarchies, and bullying are a part of recess. And so, again, if we think about setting up quality of recess, if we just let the environment be whatever it is, if we just say, this is, you know, the children's time, we're not going to intervene, we're just going to send everybody out there and see what happens. Um, the research shows what happens isn't always great for a broad range of child development outcomes. 
Um, and so we want to be intentional about how we are setting up, organizing, and facilitating that space, just like we would anywhere else in the school day, where we want children to have the opportunity to thrive and learn. The last piece, and, and children will talk about this, um, but we see it we see it in and what we don't see when we go to playgrounds is that children with disabilities and their limitations are often overlooked or excluded at recess. Um, the amount of playgrounds that I have been on in which we have not seen children with disabilities does not match the data in terms of prevalence rates of children with disabilities in schools, um, which I think speaks to a problem. There's not a lot of good data on this, so it's another place where we need more information. Um, but when you talk to children and when you look at data that is reporting directly from children, this is a key point that comes up. Um, so we can go to the next slide. What I want to do then is we can think about what the children think, and then I want to think of two, what are often thought of as opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of how we might do recess. So on the one end is completely unstructured play. Um, and I'm going to just highlight a little bit of Debbie Ray's work. She's at TCU and has put together an intervention called Link or Let's um, Inspire Innovation in Kids. It's based off of the Finnish model of school and outdoor play. So they do um, every day, 15 minute character lessons taught by the teacher. So a, a specific SEL curriculum um, to help translate into some of those social emotional skills at recess. Four 15 minute daily recesses. So 60 minutes of recess a day broken up into four segments. Um, and there's a, there's a big focus on unstructured play. So a focus away from sport and games, um, you know, and, and really more kind of natural interaction with the environment. There's a focus on strong transitions and there's really at recess itself, limited adult engagement and influence. And so if we look at some of the data points from this on the next slide, um, we see that her work shows that Children who are involved in the LINK intervention see improvements in math scores and reading scores and on-task behaviors and positive emotions and, and then in some of the physical markers like body composition and physical activity. Um, I know that they have data kind of through and since COVID that also show children have a lower stress response um, when they get 60 minutes of recess a day as compared to some lower doses of recess. And so if we look at, you know, building a quality environment, intentionally building a quality environment and giving children access to recess at multiple points throughout the day, we see really good outcomes. Um, on the other end of the spectrum in the next slide, some of the work that we've done and we've partnered a lot with Playworks, who's a national organization who does recess. We've done some outcome evaluations for them. Um, but one of the things that we look at and measure observationally on playgrounds is the safety and structure of the playground, the level of adult engagement and supervision. And so we look at our adults out there modeling positive culture and actively engaging with students. We look at student behaviors. Can they solve their own conflicts? Um, do they have problem solving skills? Are there physical and verbal altercations that are happening? Um, if so, like how can they handle it without adult um, intervention? We look at the transitions and we look at what kids are doing and how active they are. Um, and again, we've seen results over the course of time in multiple studies on the next slide here. Um, and a lot of this um, is, is correlated evidence, not um, not causal, but we see that a quality organized recess is related to increased play, more adaptive classroom behaviors, better levels of emotional control, less executive functioning problems, lower BMI in a positive school climate. And we see that when controlling for a variety of social demographic factors. Um, and so one of the things that I think really stands out, we, we often, and even in the original definition, think of recess as this is a children's personal time and space. Um, and I certainly would not disagree with that. But I also think when we when we consider access and quality, we have to consider the role of the adults, because whether we're looking at 
you know, what the children are telling us, whether we're looking at unstructured recess interventions that have positive outcomes, or whether we're looking at more organized recesses, recesses with positive outcomes, um, what's common to all of them is intentionality from adults and building an environment that children can thrive in. It might not be that adults are interfering live in action in that environment, but they are doing things to make sure that we're teaching positive social emotional skills. We're working on how those transfer to the recess environment. We're setting up the environment for success in the first place and not just leaving it to chance. And so I think as we consider, you know, policy and practices and national surveillance of recess and what's actually happening, um, we have to consider the quality because if we don't, um, you know, while physical activity is great, if it's happening in a context in which social, emotional, and cognitive growth cannot happen, uh, then I would argue we need to just do better for our kids. So with that, um, I'm going to flip it back over to Kim, and she is going to take us home. Thanks, Will. So I, I'm sure it's come across that Will and I both think that kids should have access to enough high-quality recess uh, here in the United States. However, we also recognize that time's a limited resource in school. So if kids are in school for seven hours per day on average, we have to obviously cover all of these core academic subjects, which take up the bulk of the day. Then of course we have to feed kids. So they're gonna have lunch. And lastly, in a lot of places, it's mandated that children have access to physical education. And so there's not a lot of time left for recess. And so when, I, when I've when i been thinking about, okay, well, how then can we ensure that all children have access to enough high quality recess? And how can we make sure that that access is equitable? Uh, one kind of obvious option to me was state law. And the reason state law, I think, kind of works here is because it has the potential to have a lot of positive downstream effects. So if we have a state policy about recess, that then can drive district, school district level policies, school level policies, school level recess provision, as well as directly influencing children in a, in a beneficial way. And so in these next couple of minutes, I'm just gonna go a very whirlwind tour of some of our recent work on the influence of state level recess law, uh, and then we'll move on to the question and answer. So, a really great resource, if you haven't seen it before, um, is the classification of laws associated with school students or class data resource um, through the National Cancer Institute. They update this database every year, um, and it has information about uh, state level policies regarding uh, nutrition, physical education, physical activity, as well as school rece recess. And so in this map, uh, you can see all of the states that do and do not have a state level law about school recess. And then they're color coded based on um, kind of the strength of that law using this um, scoring system that is present for all of the, the different things that class is monitoring. So, you know, you can see that some states just recommend recess and other states are actually requiring recess. And we do see that the number of states with a state law has increased over time. So in the next slide, um, I have you know, four maps from 2004, 2010, we have 2017 and 2018. So you can see that we're kind of increasing the number of states with a policy, but we still have kind of an issue because in this last figure from 2018, uh, we actually went to each of the state laws and we scored it in a little bit of a different way than, than what you'd see in class. And that is we wanted to see the number of those CDC recess recommendations that each state law was referencing. So you remember from my bit about surveillance that there are these eight guidelines set forth by CDC in Shape America. And you can see though that most of the states, even the ones with a recess policy, don't address any of these eight recommendations. I think the max score here is five. So things like providing teachers with professional development uh, or providing recess monitors with professional development is almost never mentioned in state law. So the, the quality of these laws could definitely be improved. Despite this kind of limitation of, of really having very weak laws so far, uh, some of our research has shown, you can go to the next slide, that there is an association between having a state recess law and children's physical activity. And to be more specific, what we find is that having a state law, any law, recommending recess or requiring it, 
increases the likelihood of a child being meeting the physical activity guidelines uh, by 300%. That's a really weird way of saying that, but children are three times as likely to meet the physical activity guidelines if they live in a state with a recess policy. They also have uh, a three times lower likelihood of having difficulty making or keeping friends. We also see that if you have a state law, you're more likely to have school district level recess policies. And these are all very positive, but we also saw that there were no associations of state law with some outcomes like children's overall health, the number of times they were absent from school. However, I do wanna point out again that at that time of the analysis, we had really weak state laws. And so it's really promising that the quality and the kind of strength of state laws is improving over time. So we hope to repeat this analysis and, and we'll see if that changes anything. And we also saw that there was no association of state law with the amount of recess that schools were providing. However, if you go to the next slide, it's kind of interesting. This is the, the amount of recess provided at schools per week. And what we're seeing here is the schools that in 2014 had no recess law in place, over a 14 year period, they decreased the amount of recess provided to kids by 24 minutes per week. But the states that would go on in 2014 to have a recess policy in place that either recommended or required recess, seem to be better able to maintain the amount of recess provision over that 14 year period. But again, due to limitations in our ongoing surveillance of recess in the US, we couldn't actually do longitudinal analysis of this data. So can't make too many conclusions about that. Uh, you can go to the next slide. To kind of wrap up, I think uh, policy is definitely a promising approach to ensure that all children have equitable access to quality recess. But of course, these policies could be strengthened, like I said. They, they, they should focus not just on the quantity of recess, but also the quality by doing things like requiring professional development for recess monitors. And I think a big one here is that we can learn a lot from the research done on physical education policy, because researchers in that space have really fought the good fight. They've made sure that physical education is better understood and it's required for more children. And they've already done the research to show that quality is more important than quantity, et cetera. So we should really focus on what they've learned and use it to inform recess policy. And overall, I think if we're gonna have evidence-based um, uh, recess policies, we have to do the research and we have to survey everything, of course. So to wrap up, um, if you want to, to get in contact with any questions, you can feel free to contact either one of us. We also are interested in putting together a kind of group of people who are interested in promoting recess and recess policies, particularly in the United States. So if you wanna join that email group, um, feel free to contact either one, of the, one, either one of us and we'll add you to it. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you both so much. And we've got some time now for Q&A with both of you. So I wanna invite people in the audience to go ahead and type any questions that you have in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And I've got one question for you both uh, right out of the gate here. How have you seen COVID impact recess? Yeah, so I can hop in, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reframe it just a little bit, and I think. Um, Maybe not how we've seen it affect recess as much, but we have certainly seen schools um, struggling with that space and environment as they have come back from COVID. Um, you know, one of the things that is important to, to recognize and understand is that kids missed two years of important developmental periods. And so like for our current first graders, a lot of them didn't have preschool. Um, a lot of them didn't have an in-person learning environment in which like a lot of the social skills, self-regulation skills, how to play well with others are taught and reinforced and practiced throughout the course of a year. Um, so I think we see schools struggling. One of the, we know that, you know, there's there are disparities and there are struggles in in kids falling behind on educational outcomes. Um, and I think we need to think similarly around play and social emotional outcomes. And so um I think it's it's been a place that has had more struggle. Um, and at the same time, I think schools have leaned more towards um, 
we need to add more academics because kids are behind, but we also need to recognize that kids are behind socially and emotionally. And if we don't, um, if we don't nurture that piece, if we don't allow them to grow socially and emotionally, we're going to decrease our chances of them catching up academically as well. Um, because through play, through physical activity, through social engagement is what's going to help regulate their nervous systems and turn on some of those learning centers. And so, um, yeah, I think it's it's just been more of a struggle for everybody um, as we've come back because we see developmental gaps. And I'll just preface that to right. say that a lot of that is anecdotal just from being in a lot of schools over the last 10 months or so. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of data on, um, you know, pre post COVID differences. Another question for you, during adverse weather, such as winter or extreme heat, how can schools create equity for students that may not have appropriate clothing to take part in recess outdoors? I think one of the things that they can do is is try to think creatively about the spaces in the school. I know sometimes that's it's a challenge um, because space is tight. Um, but where are there indoor spaces where you can set up smaller contained games? Can you um, can you put together more like quiet and creative areas for kids who uh, either want to stay inside? Maybe the recess environment is sensory overload for them and they would rather stay inside and um, draw color to art um, play a board game you know i think we we think so much of recess as a physically active time which it is um but it's a time for play um and play is very broad in its definition and the needs of play for children can be very broad um and so i think we can consider how can we better utilize, you know, a back hallway where there aren't classrooms in it, um, the lunchroom when it's not being used, the library, um, maybe a classroom that a behavioral support specialist uses where quiet games could be played. So um, I definitely think there are some creative ways we can think of, you know, combined indoor, outdoor, and or use of non-traditional spaces. And we don't have great data on this, but another kind of emerging idea is that we can use the design of the playground to kind of help make sure it's still usable during these extreme weather events. So when it's super hot outside, making sure you have enough shaded areas that everyone can play in. And when it's kind of rainy or drizzly, but not a total downpour, having some covered areas where kids can play. So that's another kind of potential avenue in the long term. Thank you. And I see one question in the chat that I just want to acknowledge, or in the Q&A that I just want to acknowledge, uh, requesting a citation on the NHANES data, and we'll try to put that in the chat for you or get that to you after the presentation today. So uh, another question for both of you, how can public health professionals advocate for better recess practices? Um, well, that's a great question, and I'm not sure that I have the best answer, so I'm sure Will can jump in and give you more, but it's something that we've been talking about because, you know, we have these international groups that are focused on recess, or we have these U.S.-specific groups that are focused on PE and kind of really pushing the ball forward on making sure that these policies get passed and that schools have resources. If they want to do something about PE, they have the information right there at their fingertips and parents as well. And we don't really have something like that for recess. And that's, I think, what's really holding us back from making sure that everyone has really good quality and enough recess. And so that's something that we are kind of discussing how to best do that. So if anyone has ideas, feel free to email either of us. But Will, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say, one, we probably can do a lot better at translating the work we do into everyday applicable things. Um, if you look at where people have had success in terms of advocating for recess, oftentimes it's connected to their local and or state um, parent teacher associations. And so partnering with your state PTA and or local PTA, I think is going to be, um, you know, it's a, it's a strategy that has worked. Um, 
parents have a lot of power when it comes to what happens in the school day, particularly parents who are organized and banded together for a common cause. Um, and so I think as public health professionals and researchers, more outreach work on the ground, partnering with our parents um, can be one way to go. Okay, another question. Are there ways to look at district or state surveillance data? And are there regions, or excuse me, are there areas or regions that have done particularly well and are successful in incorporating good reset practices? Yeah, Will, I think, could you comment on some of the new kind of policies that you think are going to be enacted over the coming years? I'll just say for my part that the problem really is that we don't have recent data on this. Um, and so, you know, even like Will showed where there's kind of these inequities and in recess provision, the data we do have at, you know, the state and the district level show that those still exist, but the data is from like 2015. So, Will, could you comment on those new state laws that you were telling me about? Um, well, I can try. <laughs> so I know right now, um, Washington, there's a group in Washington um, that's being run through the King County Play Coalition um, that is putting together a bill um, to try to support for legislation for recess in Washington. Um, I think the website for that, I'll put it in the chat, but it's recess4wa.org. Um, you know, and so it, there's some some time components in there, 45 minutes of daily recess. Um, there's banning withholding of recess. There's banning of using physical activity as punishment. There's focusing on recess before lunch. Um, and then the, you know, there's a couple of notes in there around making recess safe, inclusive, and high quality for all students. Um, but that's, you know, from a legislative standpoint, that's vague. Um, in, in just terms of like how that's enacted at a local level um, and also promoting physical activity breaks for middle and high school students. So I think another piece of that, you know, when we think of policy and legislation, um, I think we often try to think of it as, as try to be as cost neutral as we can, but if we're not providing any type of mandated provision of training of the people who are at recess, um, it's going to be tough. A lot of schools use their educational assistant or paraeducators for their recess staff. Um, and a lot of times those are folks who don't have professional development hours built into their FTE or built into their day. And so if we think about some of those policy pieces, I, I think a critical piece is making sure people are properly trained. Um, we wouldn't have untrained people in the classroom. We wouldn't have untrained people doing PE. Um, if we if we say that recess is a critical part of the school day, we need to treat it as such and make sure that we invest in it. Okay, good. And I think there was one more question that Kimberly that you wanted to answer. Sorry, I meant to respond in the Q&A and I hit the wrong button, but it was a great question about mobile phone use during recess. And I was just going to say that Charlotte Pawlowski's group with um, Dr. Schipperhein in Denmark, the same group that Dr. Massey referenced earlier, has done some really interesting work on mobile phone use during recess and the impact of having like mobile free recess. So I'll just put a, a, a link to that wherever I can and you can go read about that. But that's a really good question. Okay, excellent. I think we are uh, we are out of time for questions. Um, there were some other good questions in the Q and A, and we will try to respond if we can directly to to some of you with answers to those things. But again, thank you so much to both of our speakers today. Um, this has been a fantastic presentation, and we hope that it will lead to a more action on recess for kids in school districts across the country. So thank you again. All right, I'm going to move on and um, just cover a couple of quick announcements before we wrap up today. Um, please mark your calendar for the next Connect and Explore webinar that will happen on January 11th um, from 3 to 4 Eastern time. And our topic will be a look at trends going back to 2009 to ask the question, does WIC impact breastfeeding initiation? You can also sign up for the INCORE newsletter 
to get updates on the latest NCORE publications, tools, resources, and upcoming events. Um, you can sign up at NCORE.org forward slash e hyphen newsletter. And if you are a student, please be sure to check out the NCORE Student Hub. Um, and you can go to the NCORE webpage again to find out how to get to that. If you've used any of NCORE's tools, we would love to hear from you about it. So let us know by emailing us at NCORE at FHI360.org, and we might feature your story in our next webinar. Please be on the lookout for a survey that you will receive to evaluate this webinar. And we appreciate your input on that so that we can be sure that we are offering content that is most useful to all of you. Don't forget to follow us and like us if you haven't already done so. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. So please take a look for that. If you have any additional questions about NCORE or upcoming activities, please reach out to the NCORE Coordinating Center. And again, our email is NCORE at FHI360.org. Thank you again to everybody in our audience, and thank you to both of our speakers for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next month. Take care.